heartbreaks and heartbreaks. We seem to have fallen into a pattern. But is there a pattern at all? Separation is one of the most soul-searching moments for poets. Anxiety, dejection, hopelessness and even hope. There are so many reactions in poets in moments of separation and parting. With David Malouf, we get a whole new dimension of timelessness and time. Being and nothingness in his poem full of riddles which we might hope to solve in this upcoming video on If you are a student of English honors in any university that follows UGC latest syllabus, it's likely that you are studying David Malouf in your paper on post-colonialism. But why David Malouf of all people? Basically, David Malouf is an Australian poet. But that is not everything when you come to his background. He was born to a Christian Lebanese father and an English-born mother of Portuguese Jewish descent. In short, he has this extremely complicated mix of influences when it comes to his parents and his grandparents in that way. His father's family, they came to Australia in around 1880s. His mother's family, uh, they came a bit later, right before the First World War started. In around 1913, they came there and David Malouf was born on 20th March 1934. His full name is David George Joseph Malouf. He is a poet, a novelist, a playwright and he's a prolific writer. Prolific in the sense that he has this extremely good sense of vocabulary and his expressions are always very well thought of. In this poem, Revolving Days, uh, we get to see a very personal side of this poet. This poem was published in Duck's collection called Typewriter Music and this whole collection or anthology has these poems very peculiarly arranged. They are not arranged according to the time when they were composed or even following any pattern as such. They rather follow the way in which he experienced places. Uh, so there is an imaginative quality about the way in which this anthology is even arranged. As we will read this poem, we will try to first get the literal meaning and then we will try to have more in-depth look at the metaphors, the symbols and try to understand what other meanings does this poem generate. We will be addressing questions like why is this title so important? What are the essential key metaphors and symbols? And of course, the form and structure of the poem. And finally, we'll try to attempt a more broader reading of this poem in connection with David Malouf's idea of identity and selfhood. So let's first look at the poem. That year, I had nowhere to go. I fell in love. A very conventional sentiment, falling in love, everybody falls in love. But the first thing that catches our eye is the fact that he is trying to place falling in love in connection with boredom and not being able to go anywhere. So probably falling in love was a way in which he was trying to escape into something. He was feeling stuck and he was trying to escape into something. And then he uses a very important word, a mistake, of course, but it lasted and has lasted. Uh, when do we feel that our falling in love is a mistake? When we are in love, we feel that this is the most right thing we've ever done. We feel that falling in love is a mistake after a heartbreak when that relationship ends. So we can assume that his relationship with his lover has ended but he tells us that it has not ended so he is calling it a mistake and at the same time he is saying that this relationship has lasted and he is using 
two different tenses here. Once he has used the past tense lasted and then he uses the participle form has lasted. When you say that I did that, it means you have done something in the past. But when you say I have done it, the effect of your doing is still continuing, which means that whatever emotions he had in that relationship somehow continues to this day. Okay. The old tug at the heart, old in the sense, age old, something everybody feels and people have felt since the beginning of time. So that old traditional feeling of being in love when you feel that somebody is tugging your heart, you, you feel like that, right? The grace unasked for. When you want somebody to love you, when you apply yourself as a suitor and then you get love in return, then that is fine. But when you get that without asking for it, it's even better. Okay, it's like love sought for is good but unsought is better, that kind of a sentiment. So he says that this relationship was spontaneous, he didn't have to ask for it and therefore somehow it was more brilliant. Urgencies that boom under the pocket of a shirt. Now, because it's David Malouf, the poet, so we assume that it is a man's voice speaking to us. Now, these assumptions are common because poetry, unlike fiction, is a more personal genre, especially when the poet uses the pronoun I. So, we assume that this person speaking to us is very close to the poet himself. So, it's we have a tendency to consider these things as autobiographical. We will come to the discussion of this point later, but I just wanted to uh, mention this to keep this in your mind. Urgencies that boom under the pocket of a shirt. Now, because this is a male persona speaking to us, so he is saying that he feels that his heartbeat is right under the pocket of his shirt. What I remember is the color of the shirts. It's very funny the way memory plays tricks on us. Sometimes we Remember an event based on the colors we see, the smell we can have and these sort of sensual experiences. So, we think with our brains, we remember with our brains, fine, but those memories are created by sense organs. And in David Malouf, you get a lot of images which are captured through sensations. I'd bought them as an experiment in ways of seeing myself. Okay, so let's wrap our heads around this. He had fallen in love and he remembers feeling that tug in the heart for this person and he remembers buying quite a lot of shirts of different colors. Why? He says, I'd bought them as an experiment in ways of seeing myself. We uh, tend to groom better, uh, buy new clothes when we fall in love because we want to impress the person uh, whose attention we want to uh, attract. But here he is saying that he bought these shirts because he was experimenting with how he saw himself. So he was under the process of discovering his true self, his identity. Hoping to catch in a window as I passed what I was to be in my new life as lover. And this trying to become somebody, it's as if he has a role model in his mind and he wants to live up to his own expectation, to look like that person who he considers is to be the epitome of the perfect lover. And he wants to look like that perfect lover and so he wants to go on experiment with different kinds of dresses and shirts. And then he mentions the colors. One mint green, one pink, the third called Ivy League, tan with darker stripes, my first button down collar. So from this we understand that 
this person is talking about a time when he was pretty young maybe early teens because uh, people uh, wear button down colors all the time when they are adults so this person specifically remembers his first button down color and he's talking about that time in his life that phase in his life which is obviously uh, his teenage years it seems then we come to the next stanza we never write short sentence with an abrupt stop because we are getting curious as to what has happened to you what has happened to your relationship and he tells us that it has kind of stopped because they have stopped communicating but sometimes knotting my tie at a mirror one of those selves i had expected steps into the room so now he has become an adult he wears a tie okay so that's a symbol of adulthood you can say and even now he looks at the mirror of course when he gets ready and one of those selves you know when he was young and he was trying to look like a person that perfect lover that look he can see in himself now sometimes when he looks in the mirror wearing a tie in the next room you are waiting next room like is he actually talking about that lover being present in the next room like he is getting ready here and that person is getting ready in the next room and then he says we have not yet taken back the life we promised to pour into each other's mouths let's break this sentence up it's pretty long one we promise to pour into each other's mouths the life this is kind of a commitment that when lovers kiss especially during uh, christian weddings where the bride kisses the groom that moment when the lips touch a commitment is sealed it's as if they pour their lives into each other pour your lives means you take responsibility of each other you accept each other's follies mistakes errors and weaknesses along with everything that that person has to offer so that kind of a commitment is described beautifully here when he says we promise to pour into each other's mouths forever and forever for better for worse so we can almost situate him in a situation where uh, they were getting married in a way at least that was the feeling between them they were so close and they have not yet taken back so once that commitment is made it's very difficult to come out of that and he feels that he is still stuck in that relationship while i choose between changes to surprise you changes means he feels that he is still going on trying to look different every time he is wearing a different shirt and this desperate need to change oneself is very important because when you think that something has gone wrong you want to make it right by changing the other person or by changing yourself and a very selfless person changes himself to make things correct so this man really tries to change into something so that he can surprise the person he loves in a positive way revolving days sentences are getting shorter two words my heart in my mouth again i'm writing this for you so the previous stanza began with the fact that they never write to each other and then he begins this stanza saying revolving days it's as if his need to constantly search for his real self in the mirror to look for that perfect lover identity so that he can make everything right whatever is wrong between them this has fallen into a pattern just like one day comes after the next and it goes on forever and interestingly when we say revolving days uh, it has two meanings in this context one is when the earth moves around the sun in revolution not rotation days and nights are caused by rotation revolution brings years 
So it takes one whole year for the earth to revolve around the sun. But that has nothing to do with days. He's not saying rotating days. So revolving days here basically means days which repeat itself. It's as if he is revolving around an axis. What axis? That axis is his love. That love is like the sun of his life. And his days are revolving around this whole idea of being together with this person. But despite the fact that the earth revolves round and round the sun and had been doing that for ages, I don't know how many years, has the earth actually reached the sun? Thankfully, no. So revolving days also gives him this feeling that this whole process of, you know, somehow going around this persona of his lover will not ever end in any kind of union. His heart is in his mouth again. Now in English, uh, this expression is a figurative one, which means to be very excited or nervous about something. Why? Because he is trying to communicate about his desire, about his love through these words. I'm writing this for you. So this poem is dedicated to that person. Wherever you are, whoever is staring into your blue eyes, it is me, I'm still here. So he knows that this person is somewhere with somebody else. In the previous stanza, he said that you are in the next room. And now he is saying that you are somewhere else and he says wherever you are. So this next room of this previous stanza was definitely not literally the next room. There was nobody in the next room. It's as if he's living in a compartment, a sealed compartment, and he has no access to this next room. So it doesn't matter where his lover is because he's away from him anyway and he cannot reach him. I'm still here. So he is here in a sense. It's not just the space he is talking about. He's not talking about a particular location on earth that I am here. He is saying that he's stuck in this memory. So you have moved on maybe with somebody, maybe somebody else is looking into your eyes right now, but I am still stuck here. I'm fixed, I'm revolving around you, just you, in this one room. No, don't worry. I won't appear out of that old time to discomfort you. So he is stuck within a time, not a space. See, I was talking about time and timelessness. So this person, David Malouf, knows how to twist words. And he says that I am stuck here. And this here does not refer to space, but refers to time. Because in the next part, he says, I am in this old time. And I will not come out of this old time to disturb you. To somehow challenge your present. So he will dwell in the past. I won't appear out of that old time to discomfort you. And no, at this distance. See, now he's talking about actual space. So space, time, everything is mixed into one. And he says... At this distance, I am not holding my breath for a reply. I know I'm writing and I also know that you won't be replying me. So there's a kind of um, rejection and a hint of despair, yes. And you might think that what's so special about this poem? I want to ask you just a few questions. If you have read this poem carefully with me, you will be able to answer. What are the pronouns that this person has used? You know what pronouns are, right? Okay. I, you, me, we. There is no he or she. All right. So, he is only using pronouns. And interestingly, do not have any 
markers of gender in them. So we do not know whether this I is a man for sure or whether this you is a woman for sure. So if we read this poem with these preconceived ideas of who is the narrator here and who is the person is talking about, we will feel that this poem might appear to be a bit flat. But I want to question your assumptions. I want to question you that why do you think this I is a man and why do you think this you is a woman? If the poet wanted you to believe so, it was very easy for him to refer to this lover using pronouns like she, as we have seen in case of Pablo Neruda. Open and clear, she. Second point, what are the metaphors of clothing we find here? Pocket of a shirt, again shirts, button down collar knotting my tie all male garments so far we have seen here but we do not have any counterpart as in dress or gown or skirt so either this poem is about self-obsession where we hardly have any description of this lover persona no description of what kind of garments he used to see this person in or this poem is about shirts and identities and how our idea of gender may be questioned here. Okay, let me take you back to the first line again. That year I had nowhere to go, I fell in love, a mistake, of course. When you say a mistake, of course, it appears as if this relationship is naturally considered to be a mistake. When do we consider something as a natural mistake when it comes to love? When people choose partners going against social expectations. Now this man whose family was from different parts of the world, of course it was not a question of religion because as you can see his mother was clearly Jewish and father Christian. So no problem there. What is the other basis in which objections are raised in society? What are the other problems lovers face? Problems of repression? Gender. Love is considered to be a mistake when it is seen as a challenge to the socially acceptable idea of relationships. And I am going to now introduce you to a word which is called heteronormativity. It might sound very difficult or complex, but it's basically very simple. Normative means something which you see as normal. Okay. Hetero means sexual relationship between two different genders, that is, a man loving a woman, a woman loving a man. Simple. So when you consider that a man in love with a woman and vice versa is a normal thing, then you are viewing it through the lens of heteronormativity. When you are scared and disturbed by the idea that a man has fallen in love with another man, a woman has fallen in love with another woman, then that is called homophobia, which means you have this terror and disgust when you see two same gendered people together sexually and you consider that to be abnormal. So when he says a mistake of course it means that it is a mistake to heteronormative idea of falling in love let's move on a little bit to see if this holds what i remember is the color of the shirts now when he goes on talking about shirts and experimenting in ways of seeing myself 
we clearly can read or we can detect a kind of a subtext, something which lies hidden within the lines here. And a very common metaphor, suppose when a person is gay or lesbian and uh, he or she declares it to somebody, to friends, to family, admits his or her preferences to anybody. It is metaphorically uh, connected to the idea of coming out of the closet. Closet means the almira wardrobe where you keep your clothes. So, it is like you are hidden and then you are exposed or you are coming out of the closet. The recurrent use of images connected to dress and connecting dress to identity like he is going on changing shirts to see where he can actually find himself. It is as if he is inside that closet now and he is sifting through that mess of clothes to see which one fits him. That is a hint at the subtext that runs underneath. And then note the colors of the shirts. One mint green, one pink, the third called Ivy League. I am sure my editor will be able to show you these colors on screen. When you look at these colors, don't they look very soft and traditionally considered to be feminine. So normally we associate, again normally means not normal in that sense, but conventionally we associate masculinity with bold colors and something very rugged and rough. But these colors, especially this mint green somehow evokes a sense of such sweet feminine beauty that you simply cannot associate a mint color shirt or a pink colored shirt with a very masculine and you know hulk like man. Well, and then the next stanza is even more intriguing. This whole idea of room in the next room, in the next room, it's as if they are all locked up in these closets and they are like these rooms in which they are supposed to be stuck and they are set against each other. So, he and his lover, both of them are in the same situation, but they cannot communicate because society does not sanction these communications. Now, when David Malouf grew up eventually and metaphorically came out of his closet, confirming his homosexuality, that time society had changed a bit. But when he was growing up, these early teen years, of course, with his mother, uh, being from a Jewish tradition, pretty conventional people, Jewish people. I'm sure he wouldn't have felt very comfortable discussing his uh, sexual preferences at home and that would have led to a lot of repression and somehow this idea of a forbidden relationship brings in a lot of guilt which he calls mistake here and they have not yet taken back the life, which means in a way they have not started life in any different way even. So they had promised each other a certain kind of life. They have not been able to fulfill that promise which they have made to each other, but they could not take back the life even. And therefore they are stuck in that memory. and. Once they have actually realized their inclinations, their preferences, it is not possible for them to live in any other way. The world of adulthood and its responsibilities sometimes adds to these feelings of repression because when he is using the expression knotting my tie at a mirror, he gives this image of a responsible adult getting ready for a conference or for any public meeting facing people, facing society. You do not go on a hiking trail with your friend wearing a tie. You do not go to a night party with same minded adults wearing a tie. You wear a tie where you start pretending. And this idea of pretense 
and associating this idea of pretense with society is a very natural reaction for a person who must have felt inhibited, must have felt oppressed by the codes that society imposes on us. The third stanza from this perspective gives us more meaning where we actually begin to understand the real significance of the last two lines, old time to discomfort you. In our initial reading, we thought that he is saying that we had a past. So now you have married somebody else. I won't go and disturb you. That's the normal storyline of any bad rom-com. But he is not talking about that. He is not using the word uh, scare you. He is saying discomfort you. So this idea of being in the comfort zone. When are we in the comfort zone? When we feel that we are doing something which people around you accept. And people around us means society at large. See, society is not a monster that is lurking in the background and going to pounce on you unawares. It's not that. Society is not some stranger. Society is your father, your mother, your friends, your best friend, your sister. I would say my dog. Society is everything that starts where you end. So, when we use the word society in English literature answers, we try to give this a feeling that uh, there is this protagonist and there is this antagonist society, especially in modern fiction, modern drama, modern poetry. But society is something which has given you love, respect, understanding. And therefore, it's very natural for us to try to get approval from people who belong to that society. A little pat in the back saying, good boy, well done, from our friends, from our parents. This matters a lot, doesn't it? It's easy to say in a lecture, challenge society. But challenge society doesn't mean going in front of some big building and, you know, just revolting. It means challenge your parents, challenge your own best friend in things which you feel you should raise voice. That will make you feel uncomfortable. That is the discomfort he is talking about. He knows that if he goes and makes himself reach that person who is now comfortable in his pretending life, then he will only cause discomfort because that person will have to then go against society which actually means people with whom he has a loving relationship. And no, at this distance, I am not holding my breath for a reply. So, there is a kind of a dejection because he knows that not everybody is capable of coming out. Not everybody is capable of deciding to come out of the closet. He is very subtle, you know. He doesn't give you any open declaration here that what this poem is actually about. But he is very vocal about one thing that identity is something which is very fluid thing. And gender is something which is a very solidified code that society has produced. You know, you are born a female, but you are turned into a woman because females have biological properties, women have sociological roles or social roles to play. Same thing applies to men. Similarly, relationships have certain social codes. People expect you to behave in a certain way with other people. Now, I want to talk about one work by David Malouf, which he uh, wrote, Imaginary Life, it says. It was on the last days of Ovid, who wrote Metamorphosis. And... Uh, his preoccupation with Ovid 
is very interesting because in this poem revolving days what i feel there is an urge to metamorphose into something metamorphosis means when your identity changes because of the action of time on you that is actually metamorphosis when your body changes so your sense of yourself changes over time and this change is brought about by very little things like the way you dress the way you want to present yourself to the world i saw this very interesting documentary on david malouf which is also called imaginary life and there he uh, speaks about many things he speaks about memory and then he says that he has a photographic memory he can absolutely see what has happened in the past but uh, that memory may not be accurate which means he has an extremely uh, powerful imagination he remembers what he saw when he was 5 years old but he says that i'm not sure if that actually happened but his memory is very sharp this is how poets work so when he is talking about these different shots we feel that this person may not have actually bought so many shots but this is how he wants to remember those moments as if he was changing a lot of shots he was changing his role his identity in a way the idea of heteronormativity uh kind of presupposes that heterosexual relationship is superior and more desirable than homosexual and bisexual relationship this poem takes us away from this actually it doesn't talk about homosexuality it doesn't talk about bisexuality it doesn't talk about heterosexuality it doesn't talk about any physical component of sexuality at all see i told you the only pronouns that he uses are first person and second person there is no third person here and the most personal pronouns are free from any roles of gender and at the same time the images are so related to body and sensations and this degendering is also a means of universalizing so this is a poem which is applicable to a man loving a woman a woman loving a man a man loving a man but not maybe a woman loving a woman because there are so many mention of shirts and uh, stuff that only men use so this kind of frees the poem from any responsibility of claiming any particular kind of relationship and that is basically liberation from even the idea of homosexuality so the non gendered pronouns i me you and we they basically shape our identities and our relationship to each other and this recurrent use of these pronouns and careful annihilation of third person pronouns might be seen as a literary strategy of david malouf to somehow present a poem which is asexual i also want to mention to you something that david malouf said in the documentary he says that poetry is often deceptive in uh, when it says i where we always assume that that i that means whenever a poem uses i we always feel that this i and all its feeling should be absolutely genuine but writing of poetry itself leads you to express more than you felt so he thinks that when he starts writing a poem he doesn't have to always stick to actual feelings that he had his imagination would lead him to express things which he might not have felt this is his own words and i strongly encourage you to watch that documentary again i'll try to give the link in the description it's very 
exciting when you actually see the poet because normally we only uh, read about things or read things written by poets and writers whose photos are in black and white. Like they are so dead that we don't have a video of these people. With Malouf, you can see him talking at you, to you, on screen, on camera. So watch it. It's a rare experience and you would really feel very attracted to this man's idea of imagination and the way he considers writing as a means to express what he cannot in real life. So writing persona is different from the real David Malouf as he himself says. So why do we study this in post-colonial literature? Post-coloniality as I have always maintained is about this multiplicity of voices and here he is establishing the need to break away from conventions and that he does by means of the images that he uses. His shirts are very new and crisp because we might have seen imagery of dress everywhere like in Macbeth for example so much of dress imagery there but connecting that to the idea of closet and coming out of identity and reinventing these metaphors that is something very post-colonial and Australia though it might seem to be just an extension of Britain to us Indians uh, it's not like that you know when it comes to post-colonialism two words are very important one is center and one is edge edge or what we call margin center means the point in the middle of a circle which means that normally Europeans they thought that we write and that is what the center writes and we see the whole world around us and the way we look at the entire world is reality. So we write the history of the world. We are at the center and they focus on themselves and construct history around them. So they are at the center that is called Eurocentricism. All right, Europe at the center. But center also means a point through which force or power is exerted as in center of gravity. Center of gravity means the point where the earth pulls you most. So center means the point of power too. So it's not just a position of looking at things around you but it's also a position from where you exert power and you define how that circle would look like. Margin or edge means the boundary and when compared to center boundary is a place where the voices are not heard you know people who do not actually mean much to people at the center but edge also means the part where two surfaces meet I'll give you an example take this box for instance this is the edge. So there is the surface here and there is the surface here and there is the middle. So edge is not a boundary here. It is a point of meeting of two cultures metaphorically. So when we look at Malouf and his writings and Australia, we just don't look at an extension of European writing. We look at a man who looks at the lives of the aborigines of Australia as the real natives of that place. So there is a sense of displacement in him where he feels that he doesn't own Australia. Australia is owned by people who have been there. There may not be a history written by them because they do not have the knowledge of the language used by the Europeans. But that doesn't make them any less 
important or any less claimers of ownership. New literature tries to present these things, you know, in a way. So, in writings of poets like David Malouf, we find that element of new literature which tries to look back at the center from the edge trying to redefine it. Because by challenging the so-called conventional center, they will be able to challenge those Eurocentric ideas of sexuality as well. So, every revolt is related to each other and fundamentally all of them involve challenging society right around you or else you end up being stuck in a room and you feel that you are spinning within those revolving days and memory is not something which is a linear thing a straight line it itself revolves around events which we try to remember with greater emphasis. There are more important events in our life, the less important events. And our memory tends to cling and revolve around the more important ones. So we choose which memory we give importance to. So figures of speech, mostly alteration and quite a bit of enjambment and caesura. Caesura is where a line stops abruptly, a sentence stops in the middle of a line. We never write full stop and the line doesn't end there but the sentence ends at caesura. So he is asking for a pause here and then we have enjambments like knotting my tie at a mirror. So this line continues till the next line. So he experiments with these different line forms and the most striking thing about this poem is a complete disregard of consistency in stanza length. The first stanza 10 lines. The second stanza, seven lines and the third, six lines. Ten, seven, six. There is no pattern here. It's almost prosaic if you think about it. Does it mean that with passing time, he is speaking even less? He is expressing less? Or does it mean that when he talks about his early days in the first stanza, he can't stop talking. But when he comes to the present, the now stuck in that box, he feels that he has nothing else to say. When he says my heart in my mouth again, it means that there was a time when his heart was in his mouth once. And if taken literally, it means he is speaking out whatever is there in his heart, which means that he had done so before. And still this hasn't worked for them. So speaking out doesn't matter unless both of them do because that other person might feel discomfort. And the worst enemy that people have to fight at times is fighting the urge to feel comfortable. So it doesn't matter whether this poem is about queer utopia or not. This poem is definitely about how identity and forming of identity is crucial and vital for survival. And even when you think that you won't get a reply, you should definitely speak out loud. The reply is not important. The assertion is important. The honesty is important. Because we have so many selves in us. We should know by the time we grow up which self we like the best, which self we are comfortable with. It doesn't matter whether it discomforts anybody else or not. What matters is we have been true to ourselves. So that's David Malouf and we will meet soon with our next video. Till then, stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Bye bye.